Good day to my students. So welcome to another recorded lecture of another lab discussion. I already discussed this to you during our synchronous class, but I wanted to record another version. Number one, because I know that you are overwhelmed right now with the load that is being given to you, especially because of the two days um, that was taken away from doing lectures and maybe all the requirements. So I know na natatambahan kayo right now. So I decided to record this lecture so that you can have a resource that you can go back to. You will be able to review the discussion again and also take down notes if you were not able to put your heart out or really focus during our synchronous session. So hopefully you will find this helpful and please also remember that for the midterms, it will be a hundred item exam for the laboratory. And there are only three major topics for it. Muscle and nerve tissue, the skin, and the skeletal system. So around 30% of the questions will be coming from this topic. And if you will not be able to understand or really grasp the concept, then that's already 30% that you will be losing. So I don't want that to happen. That's why I'm doubling my effort of giving you the synchronous discussion and also providing a recorded version of the lecture. So nonetheless, let's start. We are going to be tackling the integumentary system. And when we say integument, it means a tough outer protective layer or a covering layer. And that perfectly describes the skin because the integumentary system consists mainly of the skin and the other accessory structures such as the hair, the glands, and the nails, which are also found in the skin. So the skin acts as a protective layer, protecting our muscles, our bones, our internal organs from all external or outside stimuli, correct? And the integumentary system has five main functions. The first is for protection. So how does the integumentary system protect us? It protects us from water loss. So the dermis is actually very volatile. And it will lose water unless there is an outer covering and that's the function of the epidermis. Secondly, it protects us from microorganisms, right? It protects us from abrasion, from trauma, or from injury. The skin protects us from UV rays, from dust, pollen, and other materials. Secondly, the function of the integumentary system is for sensation because the receptors for pain, for heat, for cold, for pressure, and even vibration are all found in the skin, specifically in the dermis, and we will go to that later. Number three is for vitamin D production. So... When we get exposed to the sun, the skin actually produces the precursor molecule or the building blocks for active vitamin D. So it produces that building block molecule and then it is brought to the liver, then to the kidney to produce active vitamin D. So if you actually get enough sun exposure, then you won't be needing vitamin D supplements because the sun exposure will be enough to produce the daily requirement of vitamin D in the body. Remember that. Number four is temperature regulation. So when there is too much heat in the body, blood is flown to the skin. So it is purposely brought to the skin to allow the heat to dissipate, to allow the heat to evaporate, giving the skin a reddish appearance when it is hot, right? And when it is cold, it's the other way around. Blood is not allowed to go to the skin because heat will dissipate. So blood is kept away from the skin to keep the body temperature or the core temperature normal or in homeostasis. And lastly, it is for excretion. And what do we excrete through our skin? Waste products which go out through the sweat or through sebum, right? So those are the functions of the integumentary system. And I hope that um, you will remember all of those because it will definitely come out during the exams. So again, the main player for our integumentary system is the skin. So it is the primary organ of the integumentary system 
and it is the largest single organ of the body, composing around 15 to 20 percent of your total body weight. Just imagine that one fifth of your weight right now is due to your skin. Another thing, it is a continuous sheet of cutaneous membrane. So if you notice in your skin, there are no breaks, right? From the top of your head down to the soles of your foot, it is a continuous blanket of protection that you have. And there are only actually two main layers, but most recent books would include the third layer. And the two main layers are the epidermis and the dermis. And the third layer that is continually being added is the hypodermis. Just to cheer you up for this lecture, I added also pictures of um, Korean glass skin. No? Yun yung mga peg natin um, when you use your products, right? So here is a picture of the complete integumentary system or the incomplete structure of the skin, uh, rather. So we have here the epidermis, the upper layer here, the uh, outer layer, I mean. We also have the dermis and the subcutaneous fatty tissue, also known as the hypodermis. Let's talk about the epidermis first. This is a sheet of keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. You have to remember that because it will continually be asked of you. What is the epidermis composed of? What tissues is the epidermis composed of? So the correct answer to that is keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. And the reason why it is keratinized is because it goes to a process called keratinization or the production, the depositing of keratin in your epithelial cells. That's why it's called keratinization. But the most important part in your dermis is that it is divided into five layers or in our discussion we'll call it strata, singular stratum. Okay? So... The bottommost layer is stratum basale, or from the root word base. Again, that's the most bottom layer, the stratum basale. And what should you remember about stratum basale? Um, oh, anyway, I'll just discuss that later on when we go to it individually. Second is stratum spinosum. It's a very thick layer, no? From this part here to the part where, from the part where the um, cell changes its shape up until this part. That's the entire stratum spinosum. Next is your stratum granulosum. From the word granules, parang may mga dots, dots dyan, no? Sa cells. And then, next is stratum lucidum. Lucida means light. And stratum corneum. Very important that you remember these five stratums or strata. So here is a mnemonic for you to remember, no? Starting from the top, corneum, lucidum, granulosum, spinosum, and basale. So, come, let's get some beer. Corneum, lucidum, um, granulosum, spinosum, and basale. But um, here's a better one, or at least for me, no? This is the better one kasi medyo scientific or medical. The base of the skin got a layer of columnar cells. So this is start from the bottom. The base is basale, S, skin, for spinosum, G for granulosum, L for lucidum, and another C for corneum. Because if you will notice, stratum basale is composed of columnar cells. So that's why I prefer this one, because it will already remind you of the shape and the cell type of stratum basale. The base of the skin got a layer of columnar cells, okay? So let's talk about the different layers of the epidermis one by one. And let's start with stratum basale. So stratum basale is the deepest stratum or layer of the epidermis, no? as shown in this image here. It's the bottommost layer. And it is a single sheet of columnar cells. So again, from the mnemonic, the base of the skin got a layer of columnar cells. It is a columnar sheet. Okay? And you have to remember that stratum basale is mitotically active. That's why we have this picture here showing the separation no, or the pulling of the chromatids from one pole to another because it is mitotically active. It is continuously dividing. 
the stratum basale layer. And once the cells are pushed upward, the cells will continue to divide. Okay? And according to some books, the division is, it happens every 19 days. Okay? Those are the things that you have to remember for stratum basale. Next is stratum spinosum. The top layer just above stratum basale. And look at the shape. It's quite different from your columnar cells of the stratum basale. That's why it's called spinosum. Kasi meron siyang spined appearance. Meron siyang appearance na para siyang may appendages. No? It's because the cells become overly populated. They are being pushed side by side, therefore losing their shape. From being columnar, they lose their shape and some of their parts are being squished by two or more cells. Kaya they, they have these appendages. No? Uh, hopefully you, you are able to appreciate that or able to imagine that. No? Para nagkakaroon siya ng extensions kasi naiipit siya. So because of this, it gives a distorted appearance of the cells. Okay? That's why it is called distorted or spined cells. But also you have to remember that stratum spinosum is multi-layered. In fact, according to some references, ito daw yung thickest layer of the epidermis. No? Remember that. The thickest layer of the epidermis is stratum spinosum. Why is it called spinosum? Because it is spined or distorted. Bakit siya distorted? Because of the overpopulation of cells. No, They are pushing each other. And because of those pushing, some parts of them are being squished in between other cells producing appendages or extensions. Okay? Next. So when you put stratum basale and stratum spinosum together, when you take this entire unit here as a whole, they do not retain their name. They are then called stratum germinativum. So, germinativum because they are germinal cells. When you say germinal, again, mitotically active. Okay, remember that? Let's go to the next slide. So, next is your stratum granulosum and your stratum lucidum. Let's start with granulosum. So, this is the layer where protein granules are formed, giving it a granular appearance, thus the name granulosum. Diba? So if you notice, in this diagram here, you would appreciate tiny purple staining structures inside the flattened cells. You also have to keep that in mind. In stratum granulosum, they no longer retain that compressed and appendaged appearance. Instead, they appear flattened and the appearance of granules start to arise. So, why is there a sudden change in shape? It's because when they reach stratum granulosum, because of the absence of blood supply and because of the absence of nourishment, the cells die. Okay? Again, in stratum granulosum, the reason why they became flat is because they die due to the absence of vascular or blood supply and also nourishment. Plus, um, there is an appearance of the granules which are actually made of keratin. Okay? So, yeah. Next is stratum lucidum, also known as the light layer, mainly because lucidum when translated means light. So, the reason why it is called lucidum layer is because it is a very translucent layer. And when you look at it under the microscope, you would, you would see na as parang separated yung stratum corneum from stratum granulosum. Kasi parang may light no? na nandoon in between the two layers. So, another thing that's very important to know about stratum lucidum is that it is absent in thin skin. It is only found in thick skin. And ano ba yung thick skin natin? Biyan kasama yung face, ha? The thick skin is only found in your palms and in your sole, on the soles of your foot, of your feet, I mean. And thin skin is found elsewhere. Okay? So, yan. 
So why is there a need to add another layer in thick skin? To add more um, grasp. Or to give the skin an ability to for tactile sensation. Okay? Anyway, I will not ask that naman. And lastly, we have the stratum corneum. So here, we have a layer of dead keratinized tissue. Because by this time, those keratin granules has already matured. Na spread na siya all throughout the dead cell. And... Since they are dead, they continue to pile on one on top of each other, producing an extremely thick layer. But again, the thickest layer is still stratum spinosum. This specialized keratinized tissue protects the body from mechanical injury. So, ano yung mechanical injury? From abrasions, from physical trauma, no? And also, it gives the body the ability to protect itself from inward and outward diffusion of water and molecules. So that's why the skin is almost ano no um it's water repellent right so see it protects the, the the structures underneath from absorbing and giving too much water and lastly it protects the skin from invasion of microorganisms all right so remember that the cells at stratum corneum are all dead that's why there are no more nuclei presented there no? Pero saan namatay? Where did they start to die? Granulosum. But the complete absence of the cells is found in the stratum corneum. Also, very important to know that once the cells reach the stratum corneum, they are then called horny or cornified cells. Okay? Yan ang tawag sa kanya. And this layer continues to shed. That's why... Um, you use exfoliants, di ba? Mga pang exfoliate to remove the dead skin cells. Okay? So here is a representative picture, a diagram on your right, and a histologic slide on your left showing the different layers of the epidermis. So again, this layer here showing the simple layer of ano, columnar cells is called stratum basale. And that is the bottommost layer here um, that you observe in this histologic slide. It's just one layer. Okay. Basale is also where these brown structures here are found. And those are melanocytes, which gives color to the skin. Right? So remember that it might also be asked. Stratum basale is where the melanocytes or the pigment producing cells are found. Again, basale is the actively dividing layer, mitotically active. And then it is followed by stratum spinosum, which is the thickest layer, no? according to some resources. So in stratum spinosum, um, you have to remember that there are cytoplasmic processes or appendages which gives it the um, that distorted appearance, that spinous appearance, no? Next is stratum granulosum, and it's very obvious in this slide. Yan yung darker staining na layer, of course, no? Kasi may granules na siya which absorb stain, giving it a darker appearance. So, those granules are again made of keratin, and the, the, cells, are, the cells became flat, okay? Next is stratum lucidum. Again, it is a very light layer. As you can see in this image, no, ang layo ng di color difference from that dark staining granulosum and then this pinkish to purplish color of the corneum. Okay? Again, it's only found in thick skin. And the last is your stratum corneum, which is composed of around 15 to 20 layers of non-nucleated dead cells with keratin that gives it a water-repellent ability. Let's talk about the dermis now. So, if the epidermis is composed of keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, then the dermis is composed of dense, irregular, fibrous connective tissue. Let me remind you, in case you forgot, yung dense, irregular, fibrous connective tissue, yan yung may swirling appearance. No, There is no order in it. Kasi yung dense, very uniform looking, wavy, but um, dense, irregular, may swirling appearance siya. Very random yung kanyang arrangement. So it is much thicker 
ng the epidermis despite the function of the epidermis no sabi natin epidermis is for protection but really the dermis is the more thicker layer um the thing that is also unique about the dermis as compared to the epidermis is this is where the blood vessels and the nerves are found again the epidermis wala sila nun. that's why the, the cells die eventually right and the main function of the dermis is to allow the body for temperature regulation. Since the blood vessels are found here, this is where blood is brought to dissipate heat. Okay? And lastly, it contains the many sensory nerve endings, specifically for heat, for cold, for touch, for pressure, and vibration. So, tandaan nyo na rin yun. Baka maitanong na rin sa exam. No, which of these sensory nerve endings are found in the dermis? or accept, di ba? Pwede rin itanong yan. So, remember that. So, our dermis is actually divided into two layers pa. The first is the reticular layer or the bottom layer of the dermis. This is that part which is thicker and is composed of irregularly arranged protein fibers composed mainly of collagen. That's why there are skin products which has collagen because the goal is to provide the skin or the dermis with more collagen to give it that plump appearance, that hydrated appearance, no? And the next one or the upper layer is the papillary layer. Why is it called papillary? Because if you will observe in this image, it has extensions above, no? Tongue-shaped or finger-like projections pataas giving it a papillary or a bumpy appearance of the dermis. Now, the papillary layer can actually be arranged in two different ways. First, it can be arranged in regular rows and in irregular rows. When it is arranged in regular rows, then it, it, it can only be found in thick skin. And why is it arranged in such a manner? To allow better grasp. So like in our hands and in our foot, meron yan tayong regular rows of papillary layer so that when we touch something or when we hold something, we will not easily lose um, our, our grasp, lose our grip on them. Okay? So, let's go to the next slide. The hypodermis or the subcutaneous tissue or the superficial fascia, as others would call it. No? It's important to know that the hypodermis is actually not part of the skin despite the name dermis. No? Hindi talaga siya part ng skin. Why? Because it is not composed of the same structures. Sabi natin, the dermis is composed of dense, irregular, fibrous connective tissue but the hypodermis is actually composed of loose fibrous or also known as areolar connective tissue. So remember, no, yung loose fibrous or areolar tissue, it has potential spaces, maraming space. And when these spaces are deposited with adipose cells or fat, the areolar tissue is then converted into adipose tissue. Okay? So the purpose of the hypodermis is it connects the skin to the underlying muscle or bones. And if you can still remember from our discussion of the connective tissues, I discussed, if you remember, yung ability to pull the skin away from the muscles and what gives it that ability? The loose areolar connective tissue found in the hypodermis. Tandaan yun, tandaan yun, okay? So next... Let's talk about the accessory skin structures or accessory skin structures. So, mainly, dalawa lang yan or tatlo. Number one is hair and hair. Number two, nails. And number three, the sweat glands. So, important to remember also is that the hair and the nails are actually composed of keratinized tissue. Okay? The hair and the nails are composed of keratinized tissue. Ang iba lang is their, ano, their configuration or appearance. Hair is cylinder or cylindrical. And the nails is flat or in plate appearance. But both are composed of keratinized material. And for the sweat glands, there are actually two types. The first is eccrine. 
and the second type is apocrine. Okay? Ano yung difference nila? Unang difference nila, first difference is the type of um, product that they produce. So for ecrine, it's, it produces a thin, watery um, substance and usually found in sweat. Okay? Uh, but for apocrine, it produces sweat pa din, pero hindi na siya watery. Instead, it is composed of complex organic molecules that usually brings odor. So where, is it, where are these usually found? Found in the axillary and pubic regions. So again, where is the axilla? Underarm. Pubic region sa ating mga singit or near the genitals, right? So aside from the difference in the products, different din yung way nila of releasing um, their, their um, contents. So si ecrine usually palabas yan towards the surface of the skin. Si apocrine naman usually towards another structure, no? So, yeah, those are the things that you have to remember for sweat glands. So, let's talk about hair. Again, hair is composed of keratinized material in cylindrical shape. And usually, it starts with the hair follicle. Okay? So, the hair follicle, ito yan, this entire structure here, no? So, it starts out from the epidermis. And then from the epidermis, it will go down towards the dermis to produce an indentation or a depression housing or giving space for hair to grow. Yun ang hair follicle. It starts from the epidermis and then it travels downwards towards the dermis and then goes back up. Okay? Kaya nga siya made of keratin, di ba yung hair? Kasi where is keratin found? In the epidermis. Wala pong keratin sa dermis. Okay? So, nang galing siya from top, it traveled downwards and then went back up. Okay? So, that's the hair follicle. Um, next is the hair papilla. And this is that area here, also known as dermal papilla daw. But I will not use this term. I'll just stick with hair papilla. So hair papilla is at the bottom of the hair follicle. It is covered with stratum germinativum kasi again, it is found or it started from the epidermis. Kaya yan ang nakikita dyan. And important, anong meron sa stratum germinativum? They are mitotically active. So because of continuous cell division, it produces a structure with keratin that takes the shape of that cylinder and is called hair. Okay? So yun ang hair papilla. Next is the hair shaft and that is the part of the hair that is protruding above the skin. Shaft when it is outside the skin already. But we call it hair root when it is still underneath the skin. Okay? That's the hair root underneath the skin and hair shaft above the skin. Um, what else do I have to explain to you here? The hair bulb here at the bottom, that is a extended... Um, this is an extended part of the hair root where it meets the hair papilla. Yun lang naman, I guess, yung itatanong ko sa exam. Next, we also find sebaceous glands here. No? So, ang sebaceous gland, it is connected to the hair follicle. So, saan lumalabas or where does it um, bring or transport its products of sebum? Of course, towards the hair. Kasi doon siya papunta. Okay? So, um, para saan ba? Or what is the purpose of sebum? It is, it gives moisture, it conditions the hair, and also, it has antimicrobial properties. No? So, hindi pala dapat tinatanggal yung sebum. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So, what is sebum? It is an oily white substance which is rich in lipids, fat. That's why uh, you have this oily appearance on your skin no? kapag masyadong mataas yung sebum production. 
Also, we have a muscle here called erector pili. Erector pili muscles. And when it contracts or when it pulls, it causes the hair to stand. Okay? And that is what we call goosebump. Right? So, it is connected from the follicle to the superficial area of the dermis. And again, what do we call that superficial area? The papillary layer. Okay? So, this is what the hair actually looks like under the microscope. Here, we will appreciate the hair bulb, that extended part of the hair root. We also have here the hair papilla. No? So, ano yung meron sa hair papilla? Of course, we see there stratum germinativum. So, if it is stratum germinativum, what layer do we of cells do we find there? Of course, we see there columnar cells. No? What else? We also have here the hair itself. So, the middle part of the hair is actually called medulla. And the outer part of the hair is called cortex. Okay? So, what else? Let's go to the nail. The nail naman is a thin plate of stratum corneum with a very hard type of keratin. So, that's why it's the structure is very different from our hair. Although they are composed of keratinized tissue, um, iba yung structure ng nail kasi very hard type of keratin yung deposited dyan. So, usually, ang question dyan, um, where does um, nail or ano ba yung source ng nail talaga? No? Kasi if we look at this image, we will find two structures which you might be confused with, which is the nail root and the nail matrix. Okay, so let me explain this. According to Celis, the growth of nail starts with the nail root. Okay? Sa nail root daw. But according to other sources, nagsistart daw ang production ng nail from the nail matrix kasi siya nga naman yung pinakadulo, diba? That's the, um, parang the innermost layer. So, possible that um, nail is start, starts to be produced from that area. But we will settle with nail bed or nail root since that is what Celis mentioned. No? So, another thing that you have to remember is that that nail root or that nail bed is lined by stratum basale that produces the nail plate, which is what you see. No? That outer structure, nail body or nail plate ang tawag dyan. Kaya kung may question dyan, where does nail start to grow? From the nail root or the nail body? Nail root tayo. Okay? What else? So, this is what it looks like under the microscope. We have the nail root. Um, yeah, that's all that I can share. And here are the images for your laboratory exercise. But I'm sure you already were able to take a screenshot of this during our synchronous session. So, yeah, that's it. That's it. So, thank you guys for joining and hopefully you're able to um, get something out of this recorded lecture. And um, galingan ninyo sa exams ninyo, okay? God bless. Thank you.